Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Fuente and Marifel present Meet the Professor. Hello, world! <laughs> and before, hey, before, before we start the show, you're going to have a very special surprise, everybody, because the trio here is going to sing a very special person a very special song. You ready? Happy birthday, Happy birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday to you. you. In other words, all right, let's do it. Happy birthday, dear Carlito. Happy birthday to you. Many, many, many more good health. Happy birthday, Babo. Happy birthday, old man. You're looking good Happy for 85. <laughs> looking very, very good. Happy birthday, Carlito. Many, many more to come in good health, happiness. Lots of uh, lots of professor ball busting. That's the only thing I could wish you and I. Ah! Happy birthday, old man. <laughs> All right. So how was your weeks, ladies and gents? Fantastic. You look over the moon, Jose. Ah, <laughs> uh, man, a 12 and a half hours last night. I don't know why that flight was so long from Istanbul to here. I got here. I was... I was tired. I ate something, had a smoke, got up this morning around 5.30, did some stuff I had to do, but started my day with a Hemingway signature and some coffee. So I was in heaven. <laughs> heaven, I'm in heaven. <laughs> Amazing. All right. And yourself, Melanie? Uh, well, we just finished up. up charlotte cigar week i believe today is the last day for it but it's been quite eventful and a lot of great people a lot of great cigars and a lot of fun fantastic fantastic well we're about to have a time of our lives today because we have another amazing guest of honor on the fuente marifold meet the professor ladies and gentlemen we have an artist we have a writer we have a very very creative person who's coming on today and who's part of the war, the war on maintaining our rights, the war on making sure that you and I can continue enjoying our cigars and keep doing what it is we do best, growing tobacco, producing cigars, and obviously smoking them. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. Blanco, may I? <laughs> Are you going to introduce him or not? All right, let's do it. Let's do it, the three of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Antoine a warm Reed. welcome to war, to the one and only Antoine Ray. Antoine, welcome to our show. <laughs> Thank you. It's quite an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Antoine, oh, my happy brother, to have how you are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, 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 good. You know, thank God Carlito's not on today, so I'll only take shit from... Uh, from Jeremiah, even though I think he's hearing, he might make a comment there, but uh, you know how it is. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm sure he's hearing. He's listening. I'm sure he's listening. He wants two things. He wants to listen to what Antoine has to say, mm -hmm. but just as importantly, Jose, he wants to make sure he has every word out of your mouth so he can left hook you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. All right. So Antoine, you, you know the rules. If the Jose goes too far, just stick up your pinky and Melanie and I are going to be right by your side. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, let's do this. Antoine, my dear friend, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for uh, accepting the invitation. Uh, I followed your career for a long time. I've known that uh, you are one of the upcoming young and talented people, honest, and uh, that I think the best is yet to come with you. But we're going to start off with a question that I ask uh, everybody. Can you tell us what was your first premium cigar? 
you know, I knew you were going to ask that question and I really try to think back and I know what brand it was, but I'm not particularly sure what line it was. It was an archetype that was made by Ventura Cigar Company because at the time I was working at Tobacco Business. So uh, it was a cigar that was uh, readily available, I would say, uh, when we went out to uh, California to have a meeting about the magazine. So that was the first premium cigar I had. Sorry, Ted, I don't know my laptop. <laughs> didn't uh i don't know i just couldn't get the click on so i'm doing this uh thank god my phone is charged from my uh <laughs> iphone you've had a very very uh interesting career you're uh you're a journalist so you're a writer you're a uh content uh creator but your first uh kind of gig was in 2014 where you co-founded co uh uh, no, no, I got to go back a little bit. In 2010, you started. Now I remember, and you were doing something for a tobacconist uh, pipe and cigars and tobacconist uh, report or something like that. Was it? Tell yeah, us a little so, bit about that. So I graduated from college in 2006, and I went to work at a gardening magazine for uh, four and a half years or so. And uh, that magazine got sold. And of course, when things kind of get sold, my position was kind of, you know, not needed anymore because they had a whole nother team to deal with that. And so I did some freelance for a couple of months, went on to get a job at Specom International, which at the time um, published Tobacconist Magazine, Pipes and Tobaccos Magazine, Tobacco Reporter Magazine, Vapor Boys, uh, Tobacco Farm Quarterly. So I worked as a graphic designer for many of those magazines. And I spent that that started in 2010 and by 2014, um, me and Ben Stimson, who was uh, uh, the, I think, sales manager. That was his title at the time. He came up with this idea. He said, you know, I have some people who want to advertise, but no one uh, we don't have a magazine for them to advertise in. And instead of turning away money, he said, you know, can we create something uh, that they can advertise in. So we created Cigars and Leisure magazine, which was a consumer publication that ran for a couple of years. And that's when I first started to write. And I was also designing the magazine. So I was doing basically a little bit of everything, which is, is what I do now as well. Yeah, because then I remember, I think it was what, 2016, you were content director for tobacco business, right? Yes, that's right. So, um, the people at Cretech International kind of got wind of what we were doing at Cigars and Leisure. They kind of liked the idea. They had a magazine that they wanted to basically kind of reboot tobacco business. And uh, they brought me and Ben Stimson on board. And I was the digital director at the time. And it was my job to kind of give us a digital presence. Uh, they were very happy with the, um, not very happy, but they were happy with where the print magazine was, but they wanted it to kind of be brought back into kind of modern times. So I uh, built a website for it and built like social media. I'm sure people are, are familiar with the uh, email newsletters that used to go out for it. So that was all me. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of, uh, like I said, behind the scenes stuff for the magazine. And it wasn't until maybe two or three years ago that I took on the position of senior editor for that magazine before I left recently to become the content director for the Premium Cigar Association. Yeah, and uh, those are our good friends from Cretech, of course, uh, Hugo Marcasar and uh, the late uh, Sergio Montalvo that uh, passed away this year, which uh, I've known them for many, 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 many years. Really, really uh, good and, uh, and amazing people. Uh, you have, without a doubt, been around uh for a long time uh, dealing with uh with media with creation uh, digital uh, content i think a lot of people here do not really uh because a lot of people wrote to me okay so we we've seen this guy on social media could you more or less explain to people what does a director of content i know you have to create a lot of things about it but could you give us kind of a like an A to Z, the Reader's Digest short version of it so, so people could understand. 
<laughs> Listen, for, for anybody who is under the age of 90, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, you'll understand the jargon of content creators and, uh, and, and, and editors, but for anybody out there who, for some magical way, they switched on their television in their, in their late hundreds, this one's for you. Antoine, <laughs> will you please explain? <laughs> yes. So, um, so basically, with how media has been, media has started off you know, in different iterations over the years. So you had newspapers, you had magazines, you had radio, television. So all of that requires everything that you read or see is a form of content. Um, so as content director, what my job is, is to kind of take everything, all our tools that we have uh, at our disposal and pair it with the messaging that we have to get out there and, and uh, con in the I would say news items, um, con like I said, news items, uh, stories about people in the industry and like, how do we best deliver that? And that's kind of what, you know, my big task is, like, is not every story is going to be a good story to put in print. Um, not every story is going to be a good story for audio or video. So it's my job to kind of find a way to take what we have to get out there messaging wise and pair it with a um, most effective form of content possible. So like I said, that could be video, audio. Um, it could be on Instagram. It could be on LinkedIn. Uh, every, you know, all these different platforms have different needs and different ways that you have to uh, get your content out there. So that's kind of my, you know, the fun task that I have every day is uh, something comes across my desk and I'm like, how do we best get that out there? And that's kind of uh, content in a very quick nutshell. One thing uh, that I forgot to mention is that you also back, I think it was in 2020, you created or launched a deep cut uh, lives. You were interviewing people mm -hmm. like that. So how was that first experience from you from going to a digital creator and all the content you uh, uh, created and all of a sudden you're interviewing people. So it's like, you know, it was like 180 degrees uh, turnaround. So how was that experience? Uh, it was different. You know, the pandemic happened and we all were, I think you're, you're probably the same way. It's like, what do we do now? You know, we couldn't travel. We couldn't go to trade shows. We couldn't go to events. And I was sitting there, you know, on my phone, like most people. And I was seeing people do interview shows. And I know Michael Herklotz was doing a great one where he was interviewing different people that he knew from his um, life and career. And I had some other friends who used to run a podcast called the lounge experience. They were interviewing people and, you know, I was talking to them one night and I was like, that's kind of cool. Like, yeah, how do you do that? And they were saying, well, we, we do this on Instagram live. And they say, you should do it. You interview people all the time. And I was like, yeah, but it's like over the phone, like, you know, nobody ever hears the interview. And they said, well, that's, that's the fun part. It's like, they get to see you interact with these people. So I think the first one I did was basically like mid March, of 2020 and I you know I called up Matt Booth from Room 101 I'm wearing one of his t-shirts here you can see and uh I said Matt you know I'm going to do something I don't know if it'll be great it might be really bad <laughs> but will you uh, indulge my curiosity and be my first guest and he said yes and so we did an Instagram live and I did like 50 some in that first year that 2020 when we were all basically under lockdown and you know I took a, a brief break from it in 2021. I did a, a couple, but um, I've come back in the last couple of years and have continued to do that. And I think we just, a couple of weeks ago with Luciano Morales from Luciano Cigars had our 127th episode. <laughs> so it's it's been a learning process for me to kind of, like I said, go you know, from being behind the scenes and where you can edit and polish everything up and people only see the good parts to uh, doing something basically that's um, live to a, a very, you know, very minor edits, but pretty much live. Like it's, I found the best interviews that I've done don't really have, you know, pre-prepared questions. I just sit there and we just have a conversation. So it's almost like playing volleyball. Like how easy can you keep that ball in play? And that's what, you know, the conversation is. It's like an hour of me pouncing the ball back over to them and we're talking about their life and their career and everything in between is not your typical kind of questions. So it's been fun. So let me ask you this: In those interviews that you've done, mm -hmm. tell us who's going to be who has been the easiest 
And who has been the most difficult? <laughs> the easiest and the most difficult. Uh, you know, uh, I would say this. The one that made me the most nervous, I think, was Rafael Nodal um, from Tobacco Lair USA or Altidus USA. People might know him. And I think because he was the first big, I mean, all the guests were big, but he was the one that I was like, Rafael Nodal would never want to do this. And I remember... Uh, the one of the marketing people at the time who used to work at Altus approached me and said, you know, would you have Rafael Nadal on your show? And I was like, oh, you're like, sure. Like, you know, if he would come on, like, I don't, I don't know why he would come on here, but you know, sure. And it was just a great interview where I was like really nervous for some reason. And I remember he played the piano during, cause he was at home when he was doing the interview. So he got to play the piano and show off his talents. And, uh, you know, that was the easiest one, like the hardest, I don't know if there, there has been a hard one. Um, you know, my biggest concern usually with any interview is, can I keep it going for an hour? I never want to end it early. Um, so there's been some that have gone over an hour. Then I'm like kind of getting nervous. I'm like, who's going to, you know, tune in to watch, you know, an hour and a half interview. Um, so I think that's uh, the best answer I can give at this time. Antoine, since you've been around for a while, now you work for the PECA. We'll talk about the organization a little bit uh, later. But what are your thoughts before you were with the PCA and you would say to yourself, uh, they should be doing this, they should be doing that. I think this might be wrong. And what are the things now that you are responsible for the content and you're a big part of the organization? So how would you, uh, how would you describe that? Well, thinking about it, you know, when you're in a rabbit hole, like I've always been with each job and each iteration that I've uh, gone through over the years, like you really worry about too much of what other people are doing. You're kind of always worried about yourself. So the only thing I, I used to say about the PCA and at the time it was IPCPR and before that RTDA, um, I used to say like, you know, you never hear from them about when there's a victory. Like, why don't you hear more hype from them? But now they started doing that. So I think that's, you know, probably a, the best thing that they've done is kind of hype up, you know, when they do have a victory that um, they can hype up and they can talk about. Um, but they also talk through like the whole process. Like we have a couple of bills that have been introduced, uh, especially in the past couple of months in different states about tax caps. Um, and they've done a really good job at communicating to those people, those tobacconists and retailers and consumers in those states about, Hey, this is going on, you know, this is, and you know, this is how you can take action. Um, so, you know, other criticisms, I don't really have that many. I just know maybe the biggest one I had was, I forget which trade show it was, but it was the one where it was the social media posts about relevancy or something like that. I wasn't a big fan of that personally. Um, but now I'm kind of in charge of the social media. So hopefully we won't have any more moments like that. Um, I usually really do try to put a lot of thought into messaging and making everyone feel included uh, in what we're doing. So I would never want to, uh, us as an organization, put out something that makes anyone feel like they're not part of the organization or they, you know, are other or they're not welcome in the organization, um, you know. Yep. Yeah, I have, <laughs> well, we've been, uh, you know, going to the shows for many years and, and uh, seeing what they've done. And without a doubt, you know, the last the last year was a was a show that, in my opinion, I've said it hundreds of times here, was the, uh, the best show in the last five years. But it was a show where it, uh, the way it was handled, and I've said it also many times, it was uh, quality versus quantity, sent a very strong message to retailers, to consumers, to companies that we're here to stay, we're here to defend the uh, the organization, we're here to fight for the rights of people to smoke, we're here to fight the unjust uh, taxation legislation and the FDA and the and all the things that you know governments and states have tried to. Uh, harm us in a way that's really uh, repeating myself very, very harmful. But let me ask you this. When you were not 
with the organization, would uh, consumers, manufacturers, like, ask you opinions about uh, what should the PCA do and things like that? Uh, no, they wouldn't ask me because, you know, at the time, for like the last six years prior to this one, I was, you know, working with TPE. So that's a, a different trade show. So again, like we were always in the rabbit hole of worrying about like our own stuff. Um, so I never really heard, you know, nobody ever came to me and said like, what, you know, what should the PCA be doing? Um, we were always kind of like focused on like whatever we're working on here. But like you, like I said, last year, I went out to PCA on my own, um, you know, really representing my podcast deep cuts and i thought it was like you know the funnest experience i've had in a long time it was like if you not tell people you know, if you like premium cigars like this pca the trade show or what it used to be called ipcr and before that rtda it's almost like the culmination of the year like you know it, the year builds up to this pinnacle point and you get to go there and see all the different people all the different companies you get to learn about all the different releases and I actually sat in on it on the, the session that you and Carlito did. And I saw how, you know, engaged the crowd was and how the line and the, you had to be there to kind of get the sense of it because, you you know, you see social media pictures, but they never really do justice. And if you, I wish somebody had walked the line and just shown how long it was. And there was a real concern about, like, are we going to fit into this, like, session with Carlito? <laughs> <laughs> and Jose, are we going to be able to fit in here? Because it was like, I mean, it was down the hallway, like going, I was like, oh man, I was like, I should have gotten here like a, like an hour earlier or something. It was crazy, but it was that kind of excitement. And then like when the, the, the big reveal, you know, the Padron and the Fuente collaboration, that reveal, again, you hear about it and you go, oh, you know, that's cool. And I remember it was just like everyone in the trade show floor gathering in one big cluster. And again, the pictures don't do justice. You can't really even if you had a drone flying around, you couldn't really get the sense of the excitement and anticipation of that kind of stuff. And to me, that's what the trade show is about. Like that's, you know, if you like premium cigars, you sell premium cigars, you smoke premium cigars, you want to come to PCA for that experience. It's that, you know, that excitement and the networking and you get to meet people and talk to people that you, you know, see on social media, but you never, you know, have a, a good chance to sit down and have a really good conversation with them. And sometimes at the trade show, you don't either, but at least it gets the conversation started. And then afterwards you have a whole bunch of follow-ups that you need to do and new relationships are forged and some new exciting, uh, exciting collaborations kind of come out of that experience. No, definitely. And you know, that's why for years and years and years, and I've been around for a while, I've always told retailers, well, why should I go to the show? And I mean, it's not the same thing. You get to meet the people that you're doing business with, with the principals and everybody that was at that at that uh, trade show, because it's all family owned business. You can come up to those people, you know, and, and shake their hands and give them a hug and, and have a conversation and, you know, just express uh you know, what you're thinking, what you need, or if you have a problem, but you know, uh, the phone call is okay. The email is okay. A text is okay, but it's not the same thing as, uh, as being present and not because it was Carlito and myself who did that. Uh, I think that people really appreciated that. I think uh, in all the years that I've been, there hasn't been an event, you know, uh, with so many people and so many excitement like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, there's more things line up and, and, more or less trying to do something similar like we did. And, you know, when you create things and you bring up content, for, you know, for retailers and other manufacturers to see, that's when the ideas flow and you make a uh, much better show. I, I love it. I love it, Jose, when, when you sit there and you talk about how long you've been around and everything. It makes me, it makes me think of an old song that I love and I used to listen to every single day many times and you re you remind me of that song let me just play it for our guests here if i can get it going hold on a second
Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man with well, a taste. I've been around for a long, long year. So many amazes. So many. You're the devil, man. I was around with Jesus Christ. I plan the crap that I have to do. There's not enough money in the world for the crap or diamonds. Or... <laughs> Whatever in the world for the crap I have to take from uh, from Jeremiah. And thank God Carlito's not. Uh, I think right now Carlito's flying, so I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> All right. The Rolling Stones. Yeah, Jeff, you got it right. Sympathy for the devil. That's exactly Carlito and I, man. We have a soft spot for the devil, I can tell you. <laughs> you are, because you both are the devil. <laughs> Atuan, let me uh -huh. ask you let me let me ask you this we have a lot of good media content now a lot of people that do very nice shows that mm -hmm. some have been around for three or four years some have been around eight ten years there's 10 years plus but there's also and i don't want i'm not going to mention names we never mention names of companies or people but there's a lot of people who want to do this i mean Galito, myself, Mel, Rich, Jeremiah, we're not professional. We do this because we love it. <clears throat> and if we want to bring in Carlito and I do it. Carlito and I do it because we love it. And Melanie and Rich as well. You, Jose, we had to pull your leg a little bit. You know? oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the problem Guys, is that that's not that's not true. It's not true what I just said. It's a lie. You have to know that Jose calls me up every day, six times a day. To ask me who's the next guest, if we can run an extra three shows a week, <laughs> I I think this is what keeps Jose alive. This thing, you know, the funny thing about this is I do I do ninety percent of getting the people do there. I do eighty percent of the talk. Him and the other numb nuts, the, the birthday boy yesterday, they don't do shit. Nothing. I gotta do it all. Nothing. They, but we just we just we just make sure somebody will turn on the show and watch it. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, no, but I understand it. I'm not. I'm the hired help. I don't have a problem with that. And I get and I get paid. Very, You're joking. Very I'm, jo I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> You're the star of the show. Hold on. Hold on. Antoine, let me do this because if not, Jose is going to get really wicked the whole week. Hold on a second, ladies and gentlemen. This is the professor. Smile. <laughs> <There we are. laughs> Antoine, I know you've seen this show many times, and I know there's a lot of people that have me on my in my in their prayers every Sunday. And I thank all those people who pray for me because at 73 with all the shit I've gone through. But listen, Antoine, like I said, there's a lot of great, great, great uh, media people out there. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't realize, uh, I'm not don't realize how difficult really is. So for that, for those people who have gotten in or want to get in, could you give them some advice about <clears throat> the mistakes that you see? We don't have to mention a lot, that a lot of them do. If you do a show similar to other show, it's okay. But I see some of these shows that do not create anything new to like attract people. Could you give uh, our viewers a little bit of that? Yeah, I think for if you're coming in to be a media personality in the cigar industry, I think it's important for you to find your own lane. Um, I think a lot of people, they have their favorite media personality and they say, I want to be just like that person or I want to be just like that you know, website, that blog, that podcast. And they try to, as you said, copy exactly what they did and it's not authentic. And I think that's the biggest thing is that you have to find something that's authentic to you in your own style. And sometimes that means you're going to be completely left field and that's completely okay. I think sometimes it's good to kind of be different. And also you have to be willing to try out a lot of different things before you find out what works best for you. Um, I've tried out many things <laughs> and on social media over the years to find out, like I said, what works for me. And there's some things that everyone does that, you know, they, it just wouldn't feel authentic to me. So I don't do it like ratings and, and reviews. You know, I've tried it. I don't think anybody cares about what I think about that. But what I do find for me is like I, you know, having conversations with people 
um, asking those questions about their motivations and figure out why that they get into the industry. Um, that works for me. And that might not work for the next person that might, the next person might uh, have an interest in spirits and, you know, they might have a show that kind of, caters more towards spirits and cigars than it does uh, interview style. Um, so you really have to play around and be willing to fail a lot. And, uh, you know, sometimes do stuff that makes you feel silly and to find out what works best for you. True, true. Because what I see is, uh, and I agree with you, uh, a lot of people want to be like so-and-so. I mean, mm -hmm. Oh, so and so is already famous. It's like when people come up to me in the show and say, Mr. Blanco, well, you know, I'm working on this new blend. We know you smoke everything. Can you smoke the cigar? And when you have time, let me know. The first thing I ask, well, where's the cigar made? And what do you want to, to uh, what are you trying to make? When they tell me, oh, this is the next Padron or the next Pepin or the next Fuente or the next, I tell them, you're mistaken. They say, why? I said, because that already is successful. You have to be creative. I talking about it. talking about creative gentlemen, if you just give me one second, because there's somebody here who's a hell of a creative person, and he's our birthday boy, and he wants to send his regards to Antoine. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> Adios. Bye. Hey Antoine. Hey brother. Hello. Big hugs, man. Big hugs. Great to see you. I've been listening to the show, but I've been going through security and everything. But uh, I'm on a flight now. You know, me being uh, uh, Arizona. Getting back home. But anyway, brother, I'm so happy, Antoine, that you're involved with the PCA. You know, your creativity and, and your youth and, you know, that energy you're going to bring in. Not that they don't have it, but every little bit helps. And I look forward to seeing you this year at the PCA. It's going to be amazing. And uh, we're going to have a great show. I'd love to see you and give you a big, big, big hug. You I'm looking forward to seeing you. the rest of the show. And Thank you. Mr. Blanco, are you, I, you survived. I know you have uh, been traveling across the pond, and you're a lucky man, you know? <laughs> you survived today. <laughs> My love to everybody. You happy birthday. Happy birthday, old man. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. My, thank you. love you all. Thank you very much. Well, at, least, right. he was, at least he was nice to me today. <laughs> I, I guess it's because it's his birthday, and he probably took his medicine because he's, he's going to fly. He took his medicine. That's right. He took double dose of it, actually. <laughs> now I forgot where I was. What was? What were we talking about? That's that's normal, Jose. It's yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> we, were talking, we were talking about the media people who let want the, to get let media. The young, let the young. Oh man yeah, yeah. Now us. I remember. Now I remember. I was talking about those people who bring me the cigars. Like, oh, this is the next Fuente, <laughs> the next Padron the next Pepin, the next that. It's already been, it's already, those are things that are successful. You have to be, you have to be creative. You have to innovate with the size, with different tobacco, different things. Don't try to do what everybody does. I mean, if they hear me, they hear me. So don't some tell me, yeah, I think it's true, but you know, I want to go with this. Then you, a year later, they're, they're, they're out of it. Do we need more? factories no do we need more retailers yes do we need more social people yes and no what we need is more people who are professional people who are dedicated who, people who can just not see this business for dollars of course the bottom line is you have to make money but do it with love do it with passion do it with with, with the values of tradition remember the people who brought us to the dance and like my good friend and sometimes friend Jeremiah says, if you're not going to do it with passion, do not do it. And like Carlito says, it's not about cigars. It's all about the people. So I really encourage people to do things just the right way, the way we were taught by the generations of generations of people who made this industry great. I think Jeremiah has something to say about this. I, I do. I do. I just want to remind everybody that today our guest of honor is Antoine Reed, and he's the one we're interviewing. But I'm very happy. I'm very happy to get Jose's opinion as well. <laughs> so, Antoine, what do you think on the matter? No, I think for me, you know, on the media side, you know, I look at a lot of obviously consume a lot of media because I think people think like maybe as a media person, you have your blinders on and you only focus on what you're doing. But part of 
being in the media is also looking at what all the other media people are doing and what they're saying and then creating your content or your content strategy based on what's, you know, what's out there and what's not out there. Um, and what one thing I see a lot of the media doing sometimes, especially if they're new into the industry, is like they come in and, you know, their form of storytelling is regurgitating the press releases that, that get put out. And those really aren't stories like, you know, anybody can do that. Like you can copy and paste it. You can rewrite them. You know, you get a 24 hour blitz of, you know, the, that press release the next day is, is old news. Um, but that's the easiest thing to do. So, you know, I always tell people go to extra step and it takes a lot of time, but create your own stories. Now you could do that. You, you know, you might not be a writer, but you could do that in a podcast. Like I said, you can get to the, the root of why somebody created a cigar, like the story behind it. Um, you know, and that's always what I've tried to do with the cigar the stories that I've written because I've came into this industry, not as a cigar smoker. So I always thought about how do I create a story that if somebody picks up this magazine or the story or they come upon it online and they don't smoke cigars, they will be interested in it. And I think that's the angle that I wish a lot more media people would take just to kind of create, like I said, some different stories some different takes on stuff. Um, I think too much of the media right now is wrapped up in we're going to review this cigar and it's going to be like, you know, hanging out at a frat party with pros. Um, you know, joking around and stuff like that. And they kind of miss the point of the cigar industry. Like we've lost a lot of these stories that aren't being told. And some of the companies think that, you know, they've been around for so long. They think everybody knows our story, but some of the new people coming in don't know that story anymore. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work that media can and should be doing that maybe is uh, asking a lot of them right now. But I think if more people really found their angle and what makes their content different, then you would have uh, more people telling different stories. And then you have lawmakers and their circles. I mean, that's how social media works. You have your circle of influence, getting that content, getting those stories and having that completely mind flip of, oh, that's what premium cigars are about. Let me ask you a question, Antoine. Mm -hmm. as, as, um, as a content editor or writer, provider, and with all of the different facets now you're taking care of at the PCA, which I'm, I'm assuming is, is quite vast and it takes a, a multi-talented Swiss army knife basically to pull all of this off, I'm guessing. Um, what, what in all of this you know, is, is your, your turn on? Um, what, what is it where you go, you go home at night or you turn off the light and there's a big smile on your face? What does it for you in all of this? To me, it's, it's like I said, when I do an interview with someone and it's usually, you know, like I said, I tell them we, I can get the cigar stuff from your website or from your press, your latest press release. We can go wrapper binder filler there. But I, I really do try to find that motivation uh, of what made them get into this industry. So if I can have a conversation with someone one day where I, you know, get that motivation or if they can tell me, wow, that's a question I've never gotten before, then that makes me smile. That makes me feel like I've, I've done my job. Um, you know, cause I think when I started off, I was like any other media person. I was like, well, what's the cigar story? I guess it's wrapper binder filler. And, you know, it was kind of a basic story. And then I started getting away from that and saying, you know, if someone wants to go find that information, they can easily go find it in a dozen other places. I want to give them something that they can't find in other places. So when you see an interview or content come from me, sometimes I, I'll ask a question, like I said, that they, I hope people don't expect like I you have to study. I think people also think like being a part of the media is just, you know, doing interviews and posting stuff in, on Instagram. And it's a lot of work. You have to just like, you know, you have to learn how to make a cigar and what make goes into that process. You have to learn how to do media. You have to learn how to create content. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of studying. So, you know, I consume a lot of content that's obviously not cigar related. I listen to interviews. You know, most mornings of the, the week, I'll do a two and a like 2.8 mile walk and I'll listen to a podcast where they're asking questions, you know, completely weird questions. Like I was listening to a podcast the other morning and this woman asked, it was two actors. And um, this woman asked, you know, what was your favorite toy? And the guy was like, my what? And she's like, what was your favorite toy? And he was like, nobody's ever asked me that, but it sent them on a tangent that got some really meaty stuff about the life his life and you know some of the things that 
happen when he was growing up. So I think, you know, like I said, it just takes a lot of studying. And what makes me kind of tick is is getting that weird angle that when somebody says, wow, that's a question I never got asked before, or they have to really think about it, then I feel like I've, I've done my job and my day is complete. So what you're saying here and, and what I'm listening to is, is somebody who's truly a journalist at heart, because you're talking about a journalistic approach here mm -hmm. in terms of the way you, you, you research your questions, you research your audience, you research the subject you're interviewing, and then the way that you're actually communicating you're uh, requesting or you're creating an impulse of an emotion which is leaving. You, you've just said that your fate, you know, what makes you go to bed at night is almost catching that emotion that you've created and then bringing that emotion onto, the, onto your audience. So um, you, you, you seem like a journalist to me, frankly speaking. <laughs> I, I hope so. I mean, I paid for my, uh, <laughs> paid my student loans off years ago, but uh, you know, that was what I went to school for. I, I stumbled into journalism. I, I wanted to, I was always artistic and I wanted to do something artsy, but I wanted, I, you know, when I met with my academic advisor, she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I, you know, I thought about psychology, but I said, I found out there's a lot of science and math and I don't want to do that. And I was like, that's not me. And she's like, okay, well, what do you like to do? And I was like, well, I like art, but I want to, you know, no offense to other artists out there. But I said, but I want to make money. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I was like, I don't know what I would do with an art degree. And she's like, well, you know, maybe you should be a graphic designer. And I was like, I don't know what that is. And that, this was like 2002, 2003. And, you know, so it was still to me like a, a new thing. And she kind of explained it. And she said, you know, you can go through art. You can become a graphic designer by going through the art school or you can go through the journalism school. And if you go through the journalism school, you, you're going to have to have, you know, go through all the different journalism, you know, like reporting, you have to take a reporting class, uh, you know, uh, a class on media law, you have to, you know, take political science. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound fun, but I guess I'll do it. I was like, it sounds a little bit better than the art, you know, just straightforward art. So it sounds to me, Antoine, with all due respect, that by joining the cigar industry and the PCA, you, you hit the lottery because you've become a psychologist, a psychiatrist, <laughs> an artist, and a journalist all in one. <laughs> I know it's like you get get a little bit of everything uh, on a daily basis. So it's like using, you know, it's like each each job has kind of prepared me for kind of what I'm doing now. So it's it's fun uh, in that, like I said, it's not just straightforward. It's like I'm not just doing writing. Like lately, I've been doing some graphic design stuff. I've been doing some communication stuff. You know, I reach out to retailers. I say, what do you think about this? Is this something that you want? You know, and they're like, oh, it's like somebody's actually actually asking me my opinion, and they. Obviously, they love to give their opinions and I reach out to manufacturers, you know, regularly say, like, what do you think about this? Like, I'm, I want to do this kind of stories. Is there something that will be of interest to you? So to me, I try to include everyone in the process so that it's not just, you know, what you get out. It's not a product of Antoine Reed. It's really a product of a whole bunch of different people coming in and giving me their opinions, their input, telling me what works and what doesn't work, what they don't get from this you know, this media site, what they wish they got more of here and just kind of putting it out there. Cause I feel like if you give people what they want, then hopefully they consume it and they come to you and they consume it without you forcing it upon them. This is wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to run an experiment today because this Antoine character is going to, is a lot of fun and very, very intelligent. And, and we're going to try something new. We're going to run the hotspot in a few seconds and on the hotspot, Melanie, you're going to be interviewing Antoine, one question, and Antoine's going to be interviewing you, one question. And I want this to go back and forth because Antoine is witty, he's quick, he's smart, and I have a feeling he might just put Melanie in the hot spot. Hi, Antoine. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? It's, I'm doing well. Like I said, I think uh, the last time I saw you was probably at PCA last year when we were waiting in the registration line. <laughs> yes, I remember that. Oh my gosh, that was a good time. Um, okay, so I have some questions for you. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to get you in the hot spot, but we'll see. I like to play this game. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So my first question is, 
if you could pick a debatable topic first this is a two-part question first which topic would you choose and then three which panel it would be a debatable topic for manufacturers which panel of manufacturers would you put together to ask that question and have them debate it so we're talking about uh, a debatable or i don't want to say controversial or some hot topic within the cigar industry yeah uh, i would do the state of the boutique category i think that would be a very interesting because we're seeing all these different changes in the boutique category right now um mm -hmm. a panel that i would put together with that would probably be matt booth because I really like, uh, obviously he's someone who's been uh, independent and now obviously his brand is part of STG. So I think he would have a lot of great insight. Uh, Robert Caldwell, because Robert uh, is, for those who don't know, is very opinionated. So I was just telling my mother a couple of weeks ago, like, you know, Robert is the type of person, like if you ask him, he's gonna give you his like, the brutal <laughs> opinion without it being censored. So I would just love to see him up there. Um, and then I, I always throw in like someone completely different. And I think for me, uh, I think Ernesto Perez Carrillo would be a good one also to have on Cause I think- Are he you would, sure? I, well, oh I look, yeah, you, you want something that people are gonna come and, and actually see and actually like love to see. And th these are people that you don't, I always think when you're putting together a panel, you want people that that have some interactions with each other, but they aren't really, you know, so Matt and Robert, they go back and forth. So that's going to be a lot of joking. And then, you know, they all know Ernesto. And I think he would just add in like that insight from the uh, the experience of starting off Floria Cubana. And like I said, in having that sold off and then creating his own kind of boutique company now. <laughs> Yeah, I just worry about Ernesto after the fact of him being on a live with uh, <laughs> Matt Booth and Robert Caldwell. But sure, as long as he doesn't have a heart attack afterwards, we'll be fine. <laughs> All right, so I guess you're going to have to ask me a question now. When you were growing up, and here you are, uh, I, I won't want to say an influencer, but you're someone who a lot of people follow on Instagram and social media. What did you see yourself doing uh, and getting into professionally when you were growing up? Like, what did you want to be? I actually wanted to be a defense attorney. Oh, wow. And where did that come from? Um, I think it came from my, you know, you mentioned poli sci, so I have a political science degree. Um, I actually got into that during high school. We had a debate team and we had a, some kind of, I can't even, it's like a government class. I read that book in the first week, like from front to back, because I found the laws and also being able to help people kind of not all be under the gun of the law. There are some exceptions. There are, you know, some, you know, just things that may not be, you know, treat people shouldn't be treated equally sometimes in punishment. You know, it's not all about what I think we do or the things that come out of that that may be bad or good but whatever it is it's all needs to be some kind of represented in the way that everybody has a chance to be able to be judged or even by a jury you know so do you use what you learned from that getting that degree getting that education do you, do you use it regularly now <clears throat> uh i think i still have the same thought process you know the thought process is to look thoroughly through things, read it properly. I used to read contracts for a living and interpret them. And yeah, I think that there is a lot to be said about that where you can find out a lot about a person by the questions that you ask and the things that you find out more, not all, you know, the same. So yeah, it's definitely an interesting part. And just to be able to, I think having that knowledge and understanding people and the way that the people are in general, even in a government, it says a lot about getting to know people in even certain industries. So. I think that's that's cool. Did your and your parents supported you getting into, into that field always? Like, did they have? I know sometimes parents have expectations of their children; they want them to become this, and then other parents are kind of hands off in that they're like find your own way. So, what were your parents like? 
Uh, my dad was extremely supportive. My dad was almost super nosy. He knew everything about me. I mean, he was involved in everything, so I couldn't get away with anything. Uh, but I also knew how to get away with stuff because my older brother was the one who got in more trouble than I did. So I knew, okay, don't do this, but do that. Or make sure you cover it up this way, you know, <laughs> or lock the door if you're doing something bad. You know, my brother would get caught at everything. It was terrible. But um. Uh, I'd say that my parents were extremely supportive. My dad uh, wanted me to go to Dartmouth, but I did not want to move that far away from home that young of age. And also my aunt was a very successful, still a very successful divorce attorney. And she actually told me not to do it. She was like, don't do this because it tends to be uh, it's a little scary. You're going you're gonna to have a lot more stalkers than you are being an influencer. <laughs> <laughs> maybe stalkers that you don't want so yeah it was pretty awesome all right now i have one for you this is okay. going to be the hardest this is going to be a, an embarrassing hot seat question i hope you're ready for this i'm ready after being after being interviewed by jose blanco <laughs> what critique could you give him to make his interviews a little bit better no i think uh for me the the phone i think if he turned it landscape wise maybe because like when we're like all in the four corners because i do stream yard too so i know this thing so i know this stuff so maybe it'll it'll be a little bit better presentation because the black bars sometimes you know drive me me crazy in an interview but sometimes like when you're too deep into it you're like oh man you're like i can't tell them like in the middle of it to, to try it so i think that um and and i know he had some good show notes and i know that he he there were a couple things I think that he, I won't say he fumbled over the words, but there's a, a couple of parts that maybe he could have just memorized them really quickly. And, you know, I think, I, I think when he was trying to list off the 10,000 magazines I, I work for, that is a challenge because I get tongue tied as well sometimes. So that's yeah. the only thing, maybe just like do a little bit of prep so that, um, you know, you don't have to, to look down at the notes as much because I try that now, too. Sometimes I do now, that. If he's 90 years old, I guess we can give him that, you know, we'll let him give him that grace. <laughs> no, we love Jose. You say that. You say that. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything else about that. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you so much for playing our game. And, yes, Jose, we love you. There's nothing but love here. But that's awesome. So thank you so much for joining our podcast as well today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Rich's Riot. Hi, everyone. Antoine, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm amazed that you said that your first interview was with Matt Booth. Uh, we've had Matt as a guest on the show, and unfortunately, um, my friend Jeremiah had to get a Matt Booth dictionary to understand some of the things uh, he was saying, or uh, just uh, kind of pretended he didn't know what he was really talking about. Uh, I want to thank the PCA for two recent hires, Lisa Sigler, who's out there ringing doorbells and trying to get more retailers that have not joined in a while to get back into the fold, or newbies to get into it. And also, obviously, your hire uh, was going to be adding a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, I was just in a shop the other day that had an article that you had written uh, for, for a publication, and it's all framed up on the wall in his shop, and he's growing. Corey's just thrilled. He's expanding his business. And, uh, you know, he said, oh, when you see him on Sunday, thank him. So, Corey, thanks you. And uh, let's see. Uh, oh, changes from last week. Looks like Carlito's hat, which fell in the puddle last week, has dried out. He was looking good in it. And somehow Jose found a razor, and he's all clean shaven. So uh, two big changes from last week's show. Uh, today's story involves uh, a neighbor that I had in Texas. This guy had hit it big in the oil business and bought this beautiful big house. Uh, but because he was really a country boy, he also kept chickens in his yard there. And uh, one day he gets home from work and his little son runs up to him and says, Dad, Dad, our rooster's dead. He, he's lying on his back with his feet in the air. He 
says, that's what, yeah, that's rigor mortis is set in. He says, but why are you skiing the air? He says, that's so the Lord can send down an angel and just pick him up very easily by those two legs and take him, take him to heaven. He says, okay, about two weeks go by, and the husband gets home from work. The son says, Dad, I got out of school early today, but we almost lost Mom. What do you mean you almost lost Mom? He says, I got home. I went up to your bedroom, and there she was laying on her back with her feet way in the air. I figured that the Lord was going to come and get her because she was yelling, Oh, Lord, I'm coming. Oh, Lord, I'm coming. And if it wasn't for the pool boy, she might be gone. <laughs> We're sorry, Antoine. <laughs> Early oh, energy. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh Lord. Unbelievable. Uh, let's go back to the show now. Antoine, the problem is that oh, first goodness. of all, you're seeing me this way because I do the show every week on the laptop. The laptop, I don't know why. I just couldn't get it to go. And looking at my notes, it's not it's not easy to have <clears throat> the phone in your hand and looking at notes, but it's valid. Don't worry. Two last Antoine, ones. you can see how some people take criticism. It's just <laughs> incredible, isn't it? No, 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 no. I'm just I'm just <laughs> telling the facts. I'm telling the facts that he might not know that I use oh, the laptop my goodness. every week. But anyway, listen, uh, two two last uh questions. Mm -hmm. For you. In your new role now with the PCA, what is your biggest challenge? My biggest challenge is probably just bringing our communication strategy and content strategy into, you know, now. <laughs> I mean, we have a print magazine and it's great, but I'm not sure how many people actually see it. You know, I talk to some people and they say, oh, you know, I got it once and I don't get it now. So figuring out how to make sure that it's consistently getting to people um, or at least the content from it is reaching people on a regular basis. Um, you know, and like I said, it, and just uh, getting our content, you know, stories that matter to people. So stories that take place in the factory level, stories about different personalities in the industry, stories about retailers. Um, there's a lot of stories to tell. And so I'm just starting off here. So I have a, you know, hopefully many years of, you know, telling stories on a regular basis, on a weekly, um, day, you know, daily, yearly basis about just why people have chosen this industry to work in and to support. Okay, your, uh, your thoughts on this year's show, your expectations, uh, what do you think? Uh, I definitely think this year's show is going to be hopefully even more you know, even more than what you came to expect or you got out of last year's show. I know that this year, especially the Friday, I know people sometimes think when they hear educational sessions, they think, oh, like I can skip that. But we really want you to kind of come in on that Friday this year and take part in lots of these sessions. Like we have um, a keynote speaker, Oz Perlman, who I think you've seen on different television shows. Uh, he's a mentalist or a magician for those of you who don't know what a mentalist is, um, but he's going to be more doing more than entertaining. It's going to be about how you can uh, really capture the attention of your audience, which I think, believe it or not, even if you're a retailer, you have an audience. It's your customer base. And if you're a media personality, obviously you have an audience. If you're a manufacturer, you have an audience. It's your retailers and your consumers. So everyone is going to be able to get something out of that um, session. We also have a... Um, panel that's being led by Michael Herklotz that's going to have people like Nestor Placencia and Ernesto Perez Carrillo on it. We have uh, a, another blending seminar um, going on this year by Toscano. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on on that Friday. And then also knowing that how important that networking is, there are going to be nightly events that people can go to that might not be your typical cigar event. Um, but it's just going to give you more opportunities to network, to hang out with people, um, you know, around Vegas in some pretty fun locations. There's more to come on that. Um, you know, the hand rolled team who came out with a great documentary a couple of years ago, they're coming back this year to debut something new. So details on that are also being worked out, but they should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And then you just have the trade show and there's tons of new releases. I know Fuente is releasing something. Pete, 
exclusively to those who attend the PCA show. And there's a whole bunch of other companies that are working on the final details of what their releases will be for PCA. So um, it's just going to be a fun show to come to. And then, of course, uh, for next year, the show will happen even sooner. So you're going to get kind of like a quick turnaround. Um, so hopefully we'll see everyone out at this year's show. But if for some reason you can't make it to this year's show, then you'll have a opportunity in a different time frame than this year to come to PCA next year. Well, Antoine, it's been a uh, pleasure to have you on on the show. Thank you for accepting the uh, the invitation. I think that yes, a lot of people, uh, I think a lot of people understood today what your role is, uh, the experience you have, what you bring to the table, and I think a lot of people, if they really uh, pay attention or rewatch the show again, I think there's a lot of tips you gave out there that could help really a lot of people in the in the media. And I think you said very something very important, which is that all of us have our audience. And I think that sometimes the retailers, uh, I can say this from experience, I, because I've said it before, I think they lose focus and they worry about the little things and don't look at the big picture, which the big picture is the hundreds or maybe in, in, in big store, the thousands of people that go through their doors every year that sometimes they don't realize how important and the importance that they should give to those people because those are the people that make them survive, pay their bills, and build up their business. So thanks a lot for being on the show, and I look forward to seeing you at uh, the PCA for sure. Take care, my brother. Thank you. Jeremiah? Thank you, Antoine, for accepting our invitation. Yes, thank you for having me on today. It was great to uh, be on this side of the, the interviewing table, I would say. <laughs> Listen, for me, it was, a, it was a nice experience to have you. First of all, because I got to meet a gentleman, somebody who I can, I can truly feel has, um, has an interest and a passion for what he's gotten into. Um, you have a, a sensitive streak and an emotional streak, which I think can bring you very, very far in what you're doing. And bring it to you and bring it to the people around you in, in a way where there's a huge added value in terms of reality, in terms of tangibility, in terms of you, you're, you're definitely, you, and you definitely come across as somebody that is very real. And that's very refreshing. It's very nice. And it's something which I think is a great value to the PCA. And I applaud the PCA for, for giving you such responsibility. And I just can't wait for you to be able to work that magic and to, and to, uh, to bring things at, with the PCA to even greater heights. The PCA has done things in the last few years, which are absolutely amazing. It's, uh, it, was, it was very privileged um, to see how an organization um, by um, changing sales, changing routes, pulling things together, could really start moving in such a, in such a, a, a powerful way, in such a, a tangible way, in such a, a real way. And that's something which we've we've been witnessing, and, and and all of us, one way or another, have have tried to uh, to inject a little bit of fuel as much as we could, one way or another, um, to get this this ship sailing. And 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 this ship is an incredible one. And I hope that everybody out there truly, truly realizes the importance of an organization like the PCA. Um, guys, it's it's not just a question of like Antoine said of going to a trade show once a year. Um, the PCA is truly an organization. Uh, which every single day uh, is struggling uh, to put together, uh, to organize, and to solidify the rights of the premium cigar smoker in the, the, the United States of America, and, and obviously it has an impact around the world. And the work that Antoine and his colleagues are doing is, is a work which is substantially important, and I would almost say which is inevitably important for the freedoms of our, of our, of our cigar smokers out there and, and for the rights that we have. And so whoever you are and whoever's listening and whoever your friends are, support the PCA. It's, it's really no big deal uh, if everybody does it. It's that, old, it's that old saying, you know, everybody gives a dollar and, and you end up, you know, changing the world. And, and this is truly another example of that. The PCA is an organization which can use all the help it can get. These people are lobbying. These people are, 
are making sure that uh, the things are moving forward in, in massive ways. And it's not just a question of manufacturers uh, taking a, a stand at the trade show. It's also a question of every single individual out there, which one way or another uh, becomes a member or supports the PCA uh, in one form or another. And having people like Antoine on board uh, should give you all the more confidence that, uh, that this is a, a ship that's sailing in the right direction and one which is going to make a difference to us as premium cigar smokers, premium cigar enjoyers, premium cigar lovers, and to all of the uh, people who made this their life quest in the industry. Yes, thank you. And you put it so well. And for those people who kind of don't know what PCA is or you're not sure of uh, all the work that we do, you can easily go to premiumcigars.org and we have a ton of different links. We go like weekly on a weekly basis. There's some new legislation that we're, you know, fighting or we're, um, we have one. Um, and so there's industry news, there's legislation news, and there's ways that you can join the fight and also information on what you can do to uh, join and become a member. So premiumcigars.org is the best um, website to visit for more information. And if you're interested in this year's trade show, uh, we do have a new website for that, which is pcashow.org as well. Antoine, I, I very much look forward to enjoying a cigar with you this summer. I can't wait to meet you in real. <laughs> and actually, actually get to hold the real Antoine Reed and stick a cigar, stick a cigar in your mouth and light him up and make sure, make sure we can have a... You have nine weeks to, to go, so uh, not that anybody's counting. So no, my, my flights are booked, and I can tell you it's a very, very long flight for me <laughs> to get to Las Vegas. Well, I, will, I, should, I will probably be there waiting for you. <laughs> I, I, I rather hope so, and it's going to be a wonderful time. I'm getting there. When is it? On the It's the 7th uh, to, to, to 14, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, my flights are booked, and they're on the correct dates this year. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Antoine, thank you very much, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, this was another episode of the Fuente and Marifel Meet the Professor. It was a very special episode. It was an episode where we send our love to Carlito Fuente's family, Cynthia, to all the children, to Rosita, to the whole family, to the whole teams, wishing El Papo de Humo a happy, happy birthday in very, very good health and happiness for many, many more years to come. And remember, Papo, I need you to bust the professor's balls. Remember to take care of yourselves and of each other. And if you don't do it with passion, don't do it at all. And before we close the show off, because we had the devil's song, I'll play you a little secret. This is something that Carlito and I listened to after the devil's hanged up. See you next week. Bye-bye, Antoine. Thank you very much. My Lord. Great, Antoine.